They are living legends of the American West. Introduced to the continent by Spanish explorers more than 400 years ago. Captured and domesticated for use by Native American tribes. Then later, by those who came to tame America's western frontier. Over time, many found their way to freedom on the vast open rangelands of the West. In the last 40 years, the free-roaming horses and burros have been protected by federal law. Protected so diligently, in fact, that a major threat they face is their own overpopulation. Their growing numbers now threaten the health of the herds, the health of many other species of plant and animal life, and the health of these often fragile landscapes, which support many different public uses and values. They are part of a greater mosaic, the public land's legacy that belongs to all Americans. We all have a stake in the stewardship of these magnificent animals and in the balanced management of the lands they inhabit. The story of the wild horses and burros of the West began centuries ago. They were roaming the Western rangelands even before the first pilgrims arrived on the continent, brought here by Spanish explorers more than 400 years ago. When the Spanish departed, many of the horses were left behind and began populating the Western rangelands. Some were captured and domesticated by Native Americans and later by the Western pioneers and settlers. These pioneers and settlers relied on their own horses and those captured from wild herds for travel and for use in the fields. Miners and missionaries preferred burrows or sturdy mules for their endeavors. Cavalry, first protecting settlers and later fighting in international wars, relied on ranchers for remounts. With the advent of mechanized horsepower in travel, farming, mining, and other activities, many of the working animals were set free. These animals joined the free-roaming herds of the West. With few natural predators, the populations of horses and burros continued to flourish. In time, however, their survival on the open range would be threatened. On the western frontier, some considered the wild horses and burros a nuisance, a scourge on the landscape that competed with livestock for forage and damaged vegetation and water resources. Ridding the range of these unwanted animals became a common practice and over time, a profitable enterprise. Some horse runners captured and killed wild horses and burros for profit, even for sport, a practice that came to be known as Mustanging. In 1946, Congress created the Bureau of Land Management, an agency within the Department of Interior to manage the nation's vast holdings of public lands and the resources found there. The agency would eventually be charged with protecting the wild horses and burros that roamed the public lands. These protections took the form of federal laws that originated in the late 1950s as described in these historic interviews. The issue at that point was just to stop the inhumane treatment. 
They would chase the horses with airplanes and then with pickups, with trucks, and rope them and tie old tires on them on the end of the ropes till they could run them down and all of this. Many were outraged by the wanton abuse and slaughter of wild horses. None more so than a Nevada citizen, a woman of frail health but undaunted spirit, whose concern for the animals would forever influence their fate on the Western landscape. In the 50s, she, Velma Johnson, saw horses going to slaughter, and at times they were fairly beat up when they were put in the truck. They weren't very humanely treated. And she saw blood coming down the highway. And I'm sure that some of the gathering and some of the disposal that was going on was the cruel and inhumane acts that caused Thelma Johnson to become so interested and determined to do something about the way they were being treated. The best strategy for protecting the horses, advocates believed at the time, was to stop the use of aircraft and mechanized vehicles on the ground to chase and capture the animals. In Virginia City uh, is a, a relic of the Old West, and uh, many, many roundups occurred in the Virginia City area. Uh, and at that time, that is where Velma Johnston's battle began was in Story County. She tracked roundups, she tracked the trucking of animals. And because of this, um, because of the notoriety, these people out of that area gave her what they thought was a derogatory name. And that was Wild Horse Annie. And uh, actually she took it as her banner. And um, she was never ashamed of it. Velma Johnston's legacy came in the form of sweeping legislation that dramatically altered national policy regarding the treatment and the management of the wild horse and burrow populations. First, there were only small victories. In 1959, she won passage of legislation that came to be known as the Wild Horse Annie Act. Velma Johnston had fought to create a comprehensive program to protect and manage wild horses and burros. But the 1959 law fell short of that. The law simply banned the use of aircraft and motorized vehicles with the intention of halting the crude and brutal methods that had often been used to gather the animals. Unfortunately, it did not work. Yeah, the, the removal, the illegal removal of horses um, just for slaughter and even under the state laws was still happening so Annie felt that she had to go after something that would give federal federal jurisdiction at least on the public lands her determination eventually led to unanimous congressional approval of landmark legislation known as the wild free roaming horses and burrows act of 1971 during her campaign to win passage of the law, Velma Johnston enlisted the help of thousands of school children. I remember floods, boxes of letters. I mean, Velma would come into the office with a carton of just one day's mail of children that had written to her uh, how they could help her save wild horses. And it was children writing their congressman. Dr. Michael Pontrelli served as science advisor to Wild Horse Annie. He recalls their joint appearance before Congress in 1971 and the throngs of school children who descended upon the U.S. Capitol to support their cause. Not only did Andy and I testify together, we testified at the same time so that all those people were there at once. There were school children inside that herring room, um, all, all around the sides, filled all the seating, uh, kids and sitting on the, on, on the safe steps of the, of the thing, plus they had loudspeakers outside, uh, talking about the wild horses, and I mean, it was a big deal. The one thing that 
happened with Annie that I have always been proud of and still am. But at the end of this, she said, I will remember that I used the word range when we're talking about horses. We've got to protect the range. Once enacted, the 1971 law directed the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management to protect and manage the wild horses and burros in balance with other ecological resources, including wildlife species. The law authorized the agencies to inventory the animals, to establish herd management areas, to maintain the herd populations at appropriate management levels, and to remove animals from the range when those levels were exceeded. To carry out its responsibilities under the new law, the BLM conducted inventories of the wild horses and burros. The agency consulted wildlife officials, ranchers, and other private landowners and public land users. The initial objective was to identify where herds existed on millions of acres across the broad checkerboard of public and private land. The agency then identified areas of the public lands to be dedicated as herd management areas. Here, the animals could still roam in freedom and yet be managed successfully as required by the 1971 law. It was a declaration that these animals were important national symbol and they were to be managed and for the long term. But Wild Horse Annie wasn't finished. The use of aircraft and other motorized vehicles had been banned by the legislation enacted in 1959, a provision targeted at the inhumane practices of Mustangers. But by the 1970s, many began to see the potential of these tools to gather the animals more effectively, more safely, and more humanely. Among them was the most ardent champion of the wild horses and burros. Uh, we took uh, Annie out uh, a number of times uh, in a helicopter with us to show how that with experience and, and care you could use a helicopter to drive these animals much safer than you could uh, uh, just by horseback. That, uh, you know, if they got to running towards the rocks where it was going to cripple them or injure them, you could just drop over in front of them with a the helicopter and slow them down and, or turn them, showing her how you could use helicopters would be much safer than just running them by horseback uh, to, when you had to do uh, roundups. In 1976, she helped win support for an important provision of the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, or FLIPMA. This provision expressly authorized the use of motorized vehicles, including helicopters, to gather wild horses and burros for management purposes. It gave the Bureau authority for helicopter use. And Woe wasn't directly involved, but as Velma's agent, I filmed uh, the roundups. And then we started showing that film to other organizations in order to show that uh, the, they could be humane, uh, that just because it was a helicopter uh, didn't mean that the animals would be run to death, uh, that if it was done correctly, it was more humane. In the early years of the Federal Wild Horse and Burrow Program, the only feasible method of gathering the animals was to send wranglers out on horseback to chase the animals and rope them. It was an inefficient process that too often resulted in injuries, extreme stress and exhaustion for the wild horses and also the saddle horses used by the wranglers. Saddle horses always suffer more than the horses they're running. When you gather horses horseback, you have a number of riders out, which are all in danger. You hook her up, saddle horses. So it's tough on the saddle horses because they're packing all that weight and you don't have the total control as you have when you gather with a helicopter. The helicopter can coast along and let horses go slow. It's more efficient, it's safer, you don't have as many people involved in danger, and it's, uh, it's just a more efficient way to do the job. The Bureau of Land Management continues to refine gather methods to improve the health and safety of the wild horses and burros, 
and ensure the humane and caring treatment that these living legends deserve. However, no matter how careful the BLM is, there is a small mortality rate associated with gathering wild horses. This rate is usually less than 1% of all horses gathered in a year. It includes horses that come off the range in poor to very poor condition. These animals may be euthanized if they are diagnosed as unlikely to improve or do not respond to treatment. The time of year and even the time of day for gather operations are chosen to provide the most favorable climate conditions. Extreme care is taken to avoid the separation of foals and mares and to reunite them as quickly as possible if they do become separated. The animals are herded at moderate speeds over moderate distances to avoid exhaustion or dehydration. The helicopter has become an indispensable tool for conducting necessary gathers with the highest degree of efficiency and humane treatment of the animals. But the agency continues to refine the use of this tool, commissioning formal studies by others outside the agency, such as the National Academy of Sciences. I do thank the board for allowing us uh, all to come here and speak to you. Striving for full transparency and involvement of the public, the agency conducts annual meetings to invite the public to air concerns and suggestions for improving the gather policy and practices. And I also feel that until we have an accurate count, we need the roundup stopped. And I understand that if the count is over, we need to manage them. I have no issue with that. A motion must be set aside. BLM needs to show some leadership. And agendas cannot be allowed to set the tone or the direction of the discussion. But it's never too late to do the right thing, in our opinion. And we think now is the time. We embrace true reform within the Bureau of Land Management, a new, transparent, and accountable wild horse and burrow program that takes its lead from the sincere wishes of the vast majority of American citizens and taxpayers. Next, we travel to some of the rangelands where wild horses and burrows roam to learn more about how and why some of these animals are gathered from the range. I love to see all wildlife. I love all animals, so I don't want to see horses overgrazing and starving out deer. I don't want to see the loss of rabbits and elk. I want to see it all. I want to see it managed nicely. Across the western United States, BLM specialists monitor the range along with animal populations that inhabit them. Their goal is healthy horses and burros on healthy rangelands. Let's take a closer look at some of these areas. In southwestern Wyoming, inventories of wild horses in the Adobe Town and Salt Wells herd management areas show a sharp increase in populations from 2009 to 2010. The overpopulation poses a significant threat to wildlife habitat and forage. It's just a big chunk of country with a lot of horses and uh, we only have so much habitat available and if we, if we allow too many horses to be out there then um, we aren't going to have um, the habitat available for the elk and the antelope and the deer and the other species that rely on that. Railroad land grants from the 1800s created a checkerboard pattern of land ownership. The lands were divided with alternating sections of private land and federally managed public land. The 1971 Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act did not identify a specific acreage to be managed as habitat for wild horses and burrows. It recognized that animals roam on a landscape of mixed ownership. Over the years, Management units have been identified, taking into consideration such factors as availability of water, the presence of habitat for summer and winter range, and conflicts with other resource values or land ownership. To protect the property rights of private landowners, the animals must be kept within herd management areas on public lands. The agency works closely with private landowners to accomplish this. 
We believe that the livestock resource is important. We believe that the wildlife resource is important. We also have a great deal of oil and gas activity, trona mines, coal mines, power plants. That said, if we have one area that gets out of control, it affects all of the others. In the summer of 2009, the Rollins Field Office, in cooperation with the Rock Springs Field Office, flew two population surveys. Since then, our population has grown by about 25%. Because we're so far over our AML, or appropriate management level, we need to do a gather to maintain the range conditions in the herd management areas. The horses are in very good shape. Uh, the range is still in, in really good condition. Um, and if we, and if we uh, manage these horses appropriately, we'll maintain that. We'll keep the range in, in great shape. We'll be providing habitat for the other uh, wildlife species that are out there. The largest populations of wild horses and burros are found on some of the least hospitable landscapes of the West, the dry and barren rangelands of Nevada. The Montezuma Peak and the Paymaster herd management areas are located in the northern part of the Mojave Desert. These areas get no more than three to four inches of precipitation annually. As you can see across the landscape, we've got mostly shrub species here and there's very few grasses that are produced in the, in the understory. Um, in fact, there's a, an example right here. The grasses are small and they don't comprise a large uh, percentage of the plant community. With limited water and forage, ever-increasing herd populations, and competition for food and water, the animals often face a day-to-day -day struggle to survive. The whole center of this Montezuma HMA is almost devoid of, of vegetation, especially anything edible for a horse or other grazing animals. So I've seen it, it just it breaks my heart. It's turning into a dust bowl. I pass right through where all the wild horses are. And over the years, I've seen many of them that are, they're, they're starving to death. People who do not live in the West, I don't think really truly understand the circumstances that these animals live in. And I really th think that it's much more humane to keep them at levels where they can be healthy and happy. The horses don't have any nutritious forage, the waters dry up, the horses will decline in body condition and will end up with an emergency. In the mid-1990s, the horses were starving. They were extremely thin, skin and bones, and they were extremely uh, sick. We don't want our horses out here to suffer those type of consequences because these areas just aren't suited to them. Overpopulation in the horse herds is an, it's an extreme problem in some areas. If you've had to watch those herds and the little ones starve or die of dehydration or walk for miles and miles trying to find graze, it's not a pleasant experience to go through. It's very heartbreaking. So gathering is one of the ways that they can handle that. It's an absolute necessity. As you can see, we're in the bottom of the Silver King herd management area. We're down here in the valley. We're in a winter fat site, which is this plant right here. It's uh, very good for protein, especially in the winter, once it gets a good freeze on it. Uh, livestock really like it, wild horses like it. Uh, the problem is we're getting a lot of pressure. The horses fill this valley from one end to the other down here in the bottom. You can see lots of horses down here all winter long. They don't move on, they get enough storm that kind of fills up a few catch ponds and they really just hit it. What that results in is the degradation of our rangeland. This is what we call Thorley Well. And as you can see, you know, the horses have actually dug this pond out and it's got a pretty good flow to it. It tends to stay about the same year round. If you come out this way just a little bit, you'll notice the traffic and the heavy use getting into the spring. That, that's what's really creating our problem. All the trails which have degraded the rangelands, there's a lot of competition. When the competition for the water increases, it creates rangelands like this. We want to see wild horses out here, but we want to see healthy wild horses. We don't want to see them deteriorating. We don't want to see our rangelands deteriorating. It takes a long time to replace this vegetation. Once it gets down to just dirt, it makes it so it takes years and years of good water and strong vegetation to bring that back. Now, to learn more about gathering horses with helicopters, we take to the air over a herd management area in western Utah. And just about when the 
sun comes up, that's usually the best time to take off. I don't like to do it much earlier than that because you can't see the horses and saddles very good. And uh, we usually have some sort of plan. We know where where we're going to start the day. And today it's out of the middle of this huge, va huge valley, about six miles, seven miles from the trap. So we're looking for needles in one big haystack. This is a very harsh environment here in western Utah. and. Uh, we're on site with two helicopters doing the gather to try to remove some of the horses. And horses are literally traveling anywhere from 10 to 15 plus miles a day back and forth between forage and water. Extremely rugged, all lava rock, huge valleys interrupted by mountain ranges, very, very little water. One of the things that the pilots are able to do in this area, having the two helicopters, is they can actually tag team each other. They can actually help each other spot horses that maybe break away or additional animals that they might encounter. Uh, the first helicopter might encounter a second band and it can radio to the first helicopter and say, hey, I've got these horses, can you watch them for me? You got them, Robin. Okay. Get them turned once, so we'll have them going the right way. We got four horses. This is a group of horses that uh, Alan started this way two days ago. So these horses were brought over about halfway and then left them. They were starting to get tired. So they made their way over the hill down to water. Now they're right where we need them, right where we can go. So put them in the trap. So basically a three day process, but now we can take them in today. I would say that my job consists of probably 20% knowing how to fly the helicopter. Most people with a little experience and a little time in an aircraft can fly it. 80% of what we do is knowing, and knowing horses, what their behaviors are, what they want to do, what they don't want to do. They actually have to have the specialized experience or be carded in specifically herding animals. Yeah, it takes 300 hours as a training pilot to uh, get carted to fly horses. That's not uh, just pilot training, that's training underneath the wild horse and burrow program. When they go like this, they're going at their own speed. They're covering plenty of ground, they're not getting tired. Generally, this is about, what, 80% of your, your gathering. Horses walk and go in the direction you want. We're just staying back watching exactly what we want. One of the things that we're really concerned about is we need to make sure that the horses are at all times good healthy condition. And one of the one of the things that the helicopter pilot utilizes is if they see the horses that tend to maybe start getting tired, they actually may just back off and even to the point of setting the helicopter on the ground and letting the horses just go at a small, easy trot before they even even get close to the trap. The speed that we're taking the animals is the speed that they can handle. It's easy on the animals, it's not hurting them. When we know that they can go faster, we move them faster. When they're a long ways from the trap, we take our time. Everything that we do, every canyon, every ridge, every wash that we take them across, we always take into consideration what's going to be easiest on the animals. very important that we choose a trap site that we can safely and effectively gather wild horses. And this trap site has actually been used since the early 80s. This is a trap site where the horses normally would travel anyway. And you got four coming in and Alan's right behind me with a big bunch and four coming on their own. The quality of the pilots is a key on the success for this project because the experience that they have really makes or breaks whether our gather operations are going to be successful. I'm right behind you. It has nothing to do with your age. I think anybody, if you 
if you love animals and you want a horse that's good for you, I mean, at 63, I got my first Mustang. I just think it's awesome. In the summer of 2010, BLM staged one of the largest wild horse and burrow roundups in recent history. Based out of the Eagle Lake Field Office in Susanville, it took place in an area known as Twin Peaks. This vast and magnificent stretch of western landscape covers nearly 800,000 acres, most of it public land. Because of its size and complexity, the Bureau managed the Twin Peaks Gather under the Incident Command System. Originally developed in the 1970s in the Wildland Fire Program, it has been refined over the years to manage other incidents such as natural disasters. Under a well-defined command structure, this organizational tool brings staff and incident resources together to efficiently manage highly complex events and projects. Twin Peaks was the first time it was used for wild horse operations. Operationally, we'd like to collect as many horses as we can during the gather. And for us, that would be, optimally, that would be 2,200 horses. That'd be about 100%. However, we know that's not going to be achieved. Uh, if we get 90%, that would be great. An appropriate management level for this HMA, herd management area, is 450 horses. <laughs> The decision to gather at Twin Peaks was based on a methodical population census of horses and burrows conducted periodically by the BLM and on comprehensive scientific evaluations of the land and its resources. This monitoring examined the conditions of soil, forage, water resources, and riparian and wetlands habitat. Horse populations are established through our land use planning process. This planning process is open to the public. It's lengthy and it involves scientific data and public opinion in order to set horse populations. An environmental assessment is used to determine if a gather is necessary. This would include looking at the impacts the horses are having on the land. It also might find out that a gather is not necessary at all, so there would be no action needed. During the data analysis for our Twin Peaks environmental assessment, we determined that wild horses and burrows were consuming three to five times their forage allocation um, within the herd management area. What this means on the ground is they were having severe impacts to our riparian areas. Uh, we were seeing lack of vegetation, destabilized banks, and in general just poor functioning condition. In comparison to the horse numbers, livestock use in the Twin Peaks HMA was much lower. During the same time period, cattle use was only about 60% of their allocated forage, and sheep use was about 32%. Our range management, it, it's based on the condition of the land. And so we're always trying to maintain a healthy landscape. And that, of course, fluctuates with drought and wet seasons and the amount of use that's uh, demanded on multiple use lands. And so for us, it's, it's about forage and water. Cattle are managed, they're managed uh, year round, they're removed from the range, they're put back in at certain times. There's a certain number based on amount of forage we believe is out there at any given time. If there's a drought situation, then we can pull the cattle off. If they're overusing certain areas, we can pull the cattle off. Um, wildlife is not allocated forage, but wildlife also uses the same water sources and similar forages that ca cattle and horses would use. And of course, then there's horses, and they're allocated a certain amount of forage. And horses, we, we, 
we don't manage year-round. Horses are out there year-round and they're using the land and they're using the riparian areas, water sources, year-round. So that's all balanced to determine how many cattle, how many horses, and then to keep in account that the wildlife are also impacted by those numbers. The path to get there is safety, humane treatment, public accessibility, and transparency. Another unique part of the Twin Peaks Gather was unprecedented public access. Against the backdrop of this controversial and at times highly emotional program, the agency strived to enable the public to see firsthand BLM's humane treatment of the animals under its care during all phases of gathering and holding operations. I think one of the benefits of completing the Twin Peaks Gather in such an open and transparent process was that it gave us an opportunity to demonstrate to the public what a challenge it is to have BLM's multiple use mission. Large scale public access required extensive planning and greatly increased the actual cost of the Twin Peaks Gather. We need to get the job done and as safely and as efficiently as possible and law enforcement is a key component of that. Observers can with, with very little effort on their part um, disrupt or interfere with a significant amount of work that's gone into uh, getting the horses to the trap site. So it's a delicate balance between allowing the observers to observe, but also providing for that ultimate safety of the horses. There were many challenges involved in the logistics of safely allowing members of the public to watch the inherently unpredictable process of capturing large numbers of wild horses and burros in such a remote and desolate location. It really comes down to selecting what's best for the safety of the horses and taking into account viewing of the public now in a safe distance and just operationally how they can get uh, the most horses into the trap site safely. Throughout its history, BLM's Wild Horse and Burrow program has sparked controversy. Individuals and organizations have had strong feelings and at times have taken exception to BLM's management of wild horses and burrows. At Twin Peaks, we talked to some of these individuals. I'm not against the BLM, don't get me wrong. I'm not against the, the other agency charged with their protection management, which is the Forest Service. I just want them to do their job fairly and be fair to these animals and give them their rightful share. You know, a little piece of freedom, piece of land out here in, the, in these vast wide open spaces. If they have to be taken off the range, they should be in their family groups right now. It would reduce the stress, it would reduce the risk of injury, uh, it would do all manner of better things to make it about what's better for the horses and not just what's convenient to the people. My concern is that they're being excessively rounded up, that they're taking far too many and, and leaving far too few for such a vast area of nearly 800,000 acres. You realize an acre is about the size of a football field. Um, I'm aware, I've reviewed the environmental assessment, I'm aware that the allocation for livestock is about 82% of the forage whereas that for the wild horses is the remainder and then the wildlife too. After many months of planning and preparation, the Twin Peaks gather began just after dawn on August 11th. A helicopter lifted off to find horses and burros on the range and began herding them to a capture point. The first days of the gather were conducted at a location called the Skedaddle Home Range. In the weeks that followed, gather operations moved to another area so the horses and burros were closer to the trap site. And here's our trap. Once a band of horses was located, the helicopter began moving them in the general direction of the trap. As the helicopter carefully herded the animals in the direction of the trap, wings extending out on either side of their path funneled the horses into a temporary corral. This is what we, uh, what we call um, jute. Uh, it's a very soft fabric. It's made up of uh, um, just rope, um, and it acts as a visual uh, barrier for the horses so we can funnel them in into the, uh, into the corrals. Um, if they were to come in contact with this, it's very soft and pliable. Um, it's actually very easily just to break through this um, and 
and a very humane way of, of directing the animals into the trap. The helicopter often stayed a quarter mile to a half mile away from the animals, approaching closer only when necessary to keep the horses moving or to change their direction. As the pilot moved the horses closer to the trap, he radioed wranglers on the ground that they were coming in. A domestic guide horse was led by a wrangler to the entrance of the trap wings. Other wranglers hid alongside the wings, waiting for the horses to run by. The guide horse, who was trained to gallop in front of the wild horses, was released and led the animals into the portable corral. Once the horses were rested and settled, they were transported a short distance to a holding corral where they were examined by a veterinarian. Injuries that may have occurred during the gather were immediately treated, as were any pre-existing injuries the horses may have sustained before the gather. Small foals were moved separately to keep them from being hurt by larger horses. Later, they were reunited with their mares at the corral. Consistent with the Bureau's management approach, a number of strong, healthy horses were returned to the range to repopulate the herd. But before they were released back into the wild, they were freeze-marked and records were made of their age and color. The mares were vaccinated with porcine zona pellucida, or PZP, a drug to control fertility. The rate at which wild horses reproduce has been an ongoing challenge for BLM since the 1970s. The Bureau works with organizations such as the Humane Society of the United States and invests in ongoing research to develop more effective methods of fertility control. The objectives of this research are to acquire a science-based fertility control program that can serve as the primary means of maintaining healthy horse populations in the wild and to dramatically reduce the need to remove animals from the range. BLM's ultimate goal is to balance the amount of excess horses removed from western rangelands every year with the number of horses annually adopted by members of the public. What we're doing now is actually releasing the last load of mares. We're releasing them back out in this way. This is the kind of the best place to lead them because this is all their home range out here. And we have them facing that way. That way we're not really releasing them towards people. Kind of keep everybody back. And see right now how the horses are all towards the back of the trailer. What the guys will do is kind of get them to go forward, get them off the gate so you can open the gate and hopefully a horse will, you know, fall through it. See, all going forward. Then they'll carefully open the gate. Obviously, they don't want to get kicked. See, they don't want to use their flags too much. They're just, see, just a little bit. They don't want to scare them. Let one find, let one get her head out the door. See, just like that. Then they'll all start going. Nice and easy. Can't beat it. The gather at Twin Peaks that began in August was concluded six weeks later. The operation was successful in reducing the populations of wild horses and burros in the area to the upper range of appropriate management levels. I would have to say for anybody out there contemplating a Mustang, to go for it. From gather sites across the West, the animals now begin the first part of a journey that will take them to greener pastures, where many will find new homes with caring adopters. Horses and burros gathered from the range will first be transported to one of BLM's many preparation facilities, where they will be examined, receive immunization against equine diseases, and be registered in a database. Once the horses are brought in from the range, they're unloaded off the trucks. And for the most part, they're already separated by the different sex classes. And so then we just put them on feed and water um, and rest. All our facilities provide proper feed, water, and medical care. The feed that we put them on is a uh, low carbohydrate, low protein feed, similar to what they're used to on the range. Um, and then we slowly transition them into a more of a, domestic, a domesticated feed. 
The horses are brought up from a large holding pen and they're conveyed through an alley system into the tub and, and chute area. The tub uh, where we hold the larger group of animals um, is round. There's no sharp corners in it. Once they're in the tub and chute area, then they come single file through an alley into the squeeze chute. So we open the door of the squeeze chute. The individual animal comes in, the door's closed behind it. And then uh, the horse is squeezed up snugly, but not overly tight. And then we administer vaccinations. The vaccinations are very important for disease prevention in these facilities. When these horses come in from the range unvaccinated, they're, they're naive to domestic um, horse diseases. So we give them vaccines in order for prevention for that. And then age determination is done by the veterinarian. We have some special metal sticks um, that we uh, put in the horse's mouth so we can see the teeth. And then depending on tooth shape, um, angle, um, eruption determines uh, the age of the animal. Well, uh, this, this horse is about seven. 15. And then after that, deworming medication is administered orally to the animal. Once those steps are done, then uh, we shave the neck, the hair on the neck, down to skin level. This is where we're gonna apply the freeze brand. On an adult horse, we leave the freeze mark on there, or the freeze iron on there for approximately 30 seconds. What that does is it uh, alters the hair follicles in the neck, and in about six to eight weeks, that hair grows back white in color and um, the color of, or the white areas on there resemble the freeze mark. Then we hang a, a neck tag around the animal's neck. This is a, a numeric four digit um, number that each animal gets. It's part of their, their freeze brand, their freeze identification. Then we record all the information into our database, um, the freeze mark of the animal, the color, their color markings and then we can track these animals individually um, through adoption and titling. One month later, they're brought back in for another set of, uh, of booster vaccinations so they get um, the acquired immunity that they need. After that's completed, then these horses are available uh, for the adoption program. The BLM prepares horses and burros for adoption here at Indian Lakes near Fallon, Nevada and at other preparation facilities, including Palomino Valley, Nevada, Rock Springs, Wyoming, Burns, Oregon, Ridgecrest, California, and Susanville, California. We're here at the Litchfield Corrals, just outside of Susanville, Northern California's Wild Horse and Burrow Preparation Facility. We're gonna show you around the facility today and you can see some of the uh, wild horses and burros that we have inside and that will be available for adoption soon. You can see these are pretty big pens. Actually, most of these pens range in size from four to seven acres. So that's a pretty big area. It's bigger than a lot of people's property that keep horses. These horses have plenty of room to run around, chase, play, get away from each other and just be horses. And we're standing here next to one of our burrow pens. This pen has jack and gelding burrows. People really like to adopt the burrows. They're very cute, but they are also good for driving, packing, riding. People use them for guard animals to protect their sheep and goats from coyotes. So we hope that if you're interested in adopting a burrow, you can come on out and get one. In addition to public adoptions held at some of the BLM preparation facilities, the agency also takes the adoption program on the road, transporting horses and burros to adoption events in communities throughout the country. I want to welcome you to the Bureau of Land Management's Wild Horse and Burrow Adoption and to the Midland County Fairgrounds. Adoptions by internet have provided another means of introducing the public to America's living legends and finding good homes for the animals with caring and qualified adopters. We're bidding on, on Jenny 9269. We have an only bid for 125. While the BLM is eager to find homes for the animals, the agency's detailed application, screening, and inspection process ensures that the horses and burros are placed with those who are qualified to care for them. Among other requirements, adopters must demonstrate that they have adequate feed, water, and facilities to provide humane care for the animals. Since the passage of the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burros Act in 1971, 
The BLM has placed more than 220,000 wild horses and burros into the care of private citizens. Midwest Mustang Challenge! The BLM, along with the Nevada Commission for the Preservation of Wild Horses, contributed to the creation of the Mustang Heritage Foundation. The BLM now works with the foundation in sponsoring extreme Mustang makeover competitions, which showcase the abilities and benefits of adopting America's living legends. Horse trainers young and old from around the country train wild horses for approximately 90 days, getting them ready to ride. They then compete at many regional and national events. Most importantly, the Mustang Heritage Foundation helps BLM by promoting horse adoptions, providing saddle-ready horses to Americans wanting to adopt, and raising awareness with the public of the need for good homes for these animals. Thank you very much, Ryan. Partnerships with correctional facilities allow inmates to saddle train Mustangs, benefiting the adoption program and the rehabilitation of inmates who work with the horses. Seeking to provide more trained wild horses that may be more appealing to adopters, the BLM is exploring other partnerships or contractual arrangements for the training of animals to be adopted. Some of the horses gathered from the range have little likelihood of being adopted because of advanced age or other characteristics. But these horses will also find new homes where they will be cared for humanely. We ensure that the excess horses either are taken to good homes that the public take care of or they're taken to long-term pastures where they can live out their lives. When it's determined that they are not there's not a demand for that animal and it's going to actually go to one of our long-term holding pastures, then they are loaded on a straight deck truck. Those trucks then will go to a long-term holding facility and they will be offloaded at their corral and they'll be able to go into their pens where they're watered and fed for that night. From those pens, they have what they call traps, which are five to 10 acres. And those horses will be let out into the traps and for anywhere from a week to two week period of time, they'll be doing a transition period. And this is very, very important. They learn that there's a truck, they learn the sound of the truck, and the most important thing of all is they learn that truck has feet, and they like that feet. And so when they actually get them used to that and horses start coming up to it, then they will gradually let them follow the truck out to the larger pastures, which they'll do at that point in time, and then they'll be out in the pastures. The grass is like a real emerald green. I mean, it's so green. And they like chasing the green, so they're just kind of running across, grabbing little bites of green grass. And then as the year goes on uh, and turns into from the spring into the summer, you're gonna have this grass that it is up to their hocks. We have uh, project inspectors that actually is in contact with the contractors on a daily basis. Uh, they make rounds. Um, and periodically go and check the horses, talk to the contractors. They make sure that if there's any problems that they're dealt with. The wild horse and burrow specialists that work for BLM do this job because they honestly really love horses. They don't want anything bad to happen to these horses and they're looking at the whole picture because if you don't take excess horses off of the range and have a place for them, then those horses will suffer. If you don't place them in good homes, then those horses will suffer. And if you don't have a place to put these horses for the rest of their lives in large pastures so that they can have a free and roving bound, they will suffer. So the horse specialists in all aspects of the program honestly care very, very much about these horses. It's a passion. It's not a nine to five job. Believe me, it's not a nine to five job. It is a job that you only do it because you love the animals and you love what you're doing. They love you. They, you know, that you are one of a kind for them and you're not like just any other person for a Mustang. They, they see you as someone special. They exist in teeming populations never imagined when the laws to protect wild horses and burros were enacted. 
some 33,000 horses and 4,700 burros can be found today roaming millions of acres of public lands. The Bureau of Land Management can continue to provide responsible and caring stewardship for these living legends of the American frontier. Wild horse and burro herds can exist in balance with other public uses and values. Succeeding in this, however, requires that herds be maintained at populations the land can support. Without effective and vigilant management, the health of the herds and the health of the lands they inhabit will be at risk. They are part of the rich and colorful history of the American West and a cherished part of our public lands legacy, a legacy that belongs to all Americans. Their history reminds us that there is an important role for the public in the continuing stewardship of wild horses and burros. Annie's legacy, wild horses, encompasses more. One, it tells us that one person can make a difference. She told us how incredibly important our public lands are for generations to come, and how protecting it, finding out about it, learning about it, helping with it, that's a legacy. And maybe finally that my children's children would be able to go out and see wild horses running across public rangelands that are healthy. So I believe her legacy stretches over many facets. And it was probably all inspired by a love of the land.